came to praise the Lord today, believing that whatever you face this week, whatever craziness hits you upside the head, that you know that you get a realization today that my God, your God is bigger, amen, and he wants to take care of you. Give him another hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated if you'd like this morning. If you're here for the first time or first time in a long time, please make yourself at church. Uh, we just praise the Lord here with no, no gimmicks, no craziness, really. Uh, I learned a long time ago in kindergarten, they said, if you know the answer, raise your hand. And I have been raising my hand ever since, but uh, not always for that. But if I knew the answer, and so I've realized in the last 29 years of serving God and 28 years plus of ministry that God is the answer, that Jesus is the answer. And so if you see me praising, it's because I know who the answer and what the answer is, amen. And so it's great to have you with us today. We're so excited about what God's doing. And I, I, I'm, I'm just excited about the message, just to be real with you for a second. Uh, I think sometimes we're, we're easy to uh, let things slide and let things pass. And we kind of call everything okay because we're concerned, right, about messing somebody up. But uh, before I get into that message, I want to congratulate uh, Mr. and Mrs. Zach Alderson. He and Brianna tied the knot yesterday. And so uh, if you would thank you for that, and we're excited for them, man, uh, getting these guys and ladies married and goodness, it's hard to tell, right? Uh, big kids running everywhere here in about two years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, we got a five year now, seven, eight, now eight, nine, nine, uh, but today, uh, honestly, it is a privilege to be here, be your pastor, to be the shepherd here uh, along with my bride, and uh, we just love our congregation, we love our church today, we love what we do. Uh, somebody asked if I'm still working after I retired from Volvo, they said, are you still working? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, but I do have the privilege of serving the greatest church in the world, and so we, uh, we honor you guys today as well, and we thank you. Uh, the title of my message is kind of an eye catcher, hopefully. I, I hope it catches your ear today. I, I don't want to, you'll find with me, if you've not been here before, or maybe you've not been here a lot, uh, we don't offer a whole lot of sugar coating. You know, if you catch a donut in the foyer, get it, because that may be the only sugar you get. Hallelujah. Uh, and so uh, if somebody had a donut, go out there and get that thing, man. Uh, because today we're just going to talk about something that uh, a lot of pastors aren't talking about, a lot of churches aren't uh, covering really, and uh, it's a shame that we've gone this route, but I uh, feel really led. I believe in my ministry, our ministry, we feel that if we teach you how to live, we don't have to tell you how not to live. Uh, I believe that if we preach the Word of God, God will convict your heart. I don't have to name every sin in the book or tell you what's wrong or what's right. I think God does that. And so we try our best to present the gospel of Jesus Christ that you have an understanding of the Word, and then you and God work your stuff out. I don't know that we've ever uh, called anyone to the carpet or, or we've ever uh, challenged anyone with a sin, a particular sin or a particular lifestyle. I think God does that. And so maybe the difference in us here or anywhere else, and this is the only place I know. I've gone to this church and only this church for uh, over eight years, and, and so I just know what we do. And so I challenge you today as you receive the word to listen to the Lord uh, because I'm not going to call your stuff out. God does that for us, and I, I'm challenged today with this message. The Lord gave it to me a couple weeks ago. Someone has wronged you. Well, I don't want to refer to that that way today. I want you to get a clear understanding that payback is, in fact, uh, and is definitely hell. And I'm going to show it to you in the scripture. I, I know that people dance around this, tiptoe around this, and we don't preach hell anymore. And you'll find with me, we don't preach hell much because I think that once you start living right, the Bible says that he that hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. Well, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness and he fills you with that, you don't have a desire uh, to do the other things. I believe that desire begins to diminish. That desire begins to just fade further and further away. But let me share this with you. It's your choice, right? It's your choice uh, who you serve. Now, 29 plus years ago, I gave my heart to the Lord, and uh, this time I'm in it. And, and those of you that's gotten saved a lot and chased that thing, man, all your teenage years, I got saved every Sunday as a kid because I didn't want to go to hell. I mean, I'm just being real. I, I, I grew up in a... In a um, an old style Pentecostal holiness church, nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's why I am what I am and who I am today. Uh, but every Sunday I got saved just to be sure. 
because the teacher said I was going to hell. And so I don't remember getting saved for any benefit except avoiding hell. Well, I don't want you to uh, just to get saved to avoid hell. I don't want your relationship to be based on the fact that you don't want to go to hell. But I do want to make you aware today uh, that though people don't talk about it, though it's not a subject we hear about a lot, though we don't preach it very much here, hell is mentioned 167 times in the Bible. And so to me, with 167 uh, times that uh, hell is mentioned, and we uh, probably need to mention it every now and then. Uh, if you were following Jesus' ministry, he spoke about hell 33 times. Now, his ministry was only three years long, and so th three years long, that's 36 months, 33 times. That means almost an average of once a month, he spoke about hell. Now, to me, I don't think it was to, to manipulate anybody. I don't think it was to scare anybody. And just like my message today, it's not to scare you. It's not to manipulate you. It's to give you some information. This is an important public service announcement. And I want you to look at it that way. I just want this to be an education today before you leave here thinking different because someone else thought different and fed you that. According to the Word of God, there is a hell. According to the Word of God, there is a heaven. And so if you were in Jesus' church and he spoke about hell once a month, you probably wouldn't stay there. Well, okay, our society, they probably wouldn't stay there. They would probably have been settled with, hey, hit us with that about once every five years, and we'll keep your, your pay coming, and we'll keep paying tithes. But Jesus spoke about it an average of once a month or 11 times a year. And, and so I have to wonder if maybe we need to be moved more with a great compassion and a concern for our flock, like Jesus moved with compassion and concern for his followers. And so that's what I'm here for today. I'm led as a minister solely, solely to speak about hell today uh, as a topic that you get educated at a topic that you have an opportunity for you and God to get alone for a moment and you settle some things with him so that you avoid that place. You see, I grew up knowing that there's a heaven and I wanted to go there. And I grew up knowing that there was a hell and I didn't want to go there. And so I'm not whipping anybody today or anything, but I want you to understand that heaven is everlasting life and hell, according to the word, is eternal damnation and torment. And so you, we have a choice today. Uh, I, I hear the question and usually it's it's someone that's not living right. I very seldom hear this from a Christian. Uh, but whether you believe in heaven or not, or whether you believe in hell or not, uh, if you believe in one or the other, you have to believe in one and the other. Uh, because they go hand in hand, unfortunately. We have the heaven on one and, and hell on the other. And so don't be fooled today by a society that tells you everything's okay. We have a loving God, and we do. We have a God that cares about you, and we do. We have a God that doesn't care about your lifestyle and your sin, and we don't. He does care about your lifestyle and your sin, but he cares about you more than that. And, and so he was, a, he was a son, he was a Christ that was willing to give his life for us. And so it's easy for me to preach about heaven. I love to preach about the power and the authority and the uh, authority and permission given to us by the, by the sacrifice at Calvary. I love to preach about the power given to us by the empty tomb. I love to talk about everlasting life and spending eternity in the presence of the Lord. And, but at the same time, with that, as an ambassador for Christ, and I truly believe that I am and we all should be, I can't promote Christ in heaven without issuing a warning today. Amen? Can I get three more Amen. All right. And, and so while we're here, I would like to, while you're, while you're with me, the big question that I hear quite often is, uh, how, can a, how can a loving God send someone to hell? And, and so I want to challenge you with this. He is not sending anyone to hell. We have a choice. That's why he sent his son Jesus. That's why we no longer uh, have a sacrifice. That, that's why we no longer sacrifice animals. That's why we don't talk about the uh, red heifer. That's why we don't bring the bullock. That's why we don't come out here and build altars, that we all show up and, and, and at that, that sacrifice time or that feast time and bring a sacrifice. Because he said, I'm going to settle this thing once and for all, that they have an opportunity, that the work isn't on them, the work is on me. And so Jesus became that finished work that he said that, there, that, uh, that he would be pierced. And he said that he would die for us. He said that, uh, that he would give his life for us, right? And so he fulfilled that. And when he fulfilled that, that question has no uh, validity. Why would a loving God send anyone to hell? We'll start real early on. Jesus, uh, God does not send anyone to hell. He's given us an opportunity for us to choose heaven. He's given us an opportunity that if we don't choose heaven, then all practical purposes we choose hell.
But now I don't get hung up on that question. Is anybody hung up on that? Why would a loving God send anyone to hell? Don't be hung up on that. Here's your question to get hung up on. Why would a perfect God create a perfect heaven and then allow an imperfect me in there? Why would a perfect God create a perfect heaven and then allow an imperfect you access to it? You see, that should change our perspective. Instead of God sending someone to hell, the fact that he's offering us heaven, the perfect place by the perfect God for an imperfect people, that should, that should hold our attention. That should hold us captivated for just a moment while I give you my message because I guess that's the question that moves me and I guess that's the question that lets me know that I'm imperfect but I serve a perfect God. I, 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 I'm, I'm imperfect, but I serve a perfect Savior. And so the creator of heaven and earth loved me enough to send his son to die for me. And so the question for me is never hell. Sorry. I, I used to make this statement until some of the kids started chanting it on the way home and the parents didn't hear the whole message. And I would say, heaven, yes. Hell, no. Right. And so, and so if the kid left out heaven, yes, Anyway, we don't do that anymore. We used to like to do that, and you guys like to do it, and y'all can do that at home, but, you know, we make up our mind every day. I choose heaven every day. For 29 years, I've made up my mind every morning who I'm going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so I choose that every day. It's not a choice I made 29 years ago, and then I went on living like however I wanted to live. It was a daily choice for me. I want to share some scripture with you again with my title, Payback is Hell. Revelation 20 and 11 Hang on, Revelation 20 and 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, you can look up that forever and ever, and you and I, or we could tag team it, and one of us or all of us could say ever and ever and ever and ever, and that's how long they're going to be in torment. There is no end to that. There is no end for that. And so those who end up in hell, those who choose hell, not sent to hell by, by loving God, but who was offered heaven and we rejected him because of rebellion, because of pride, because of whatever reason, we chose that. And so those that choose hell, uh, those that choose that lifestyle, payback is hell. Because the enemy has been such a deceiver, payback is hell. Because the enemy has lured you with temptations, with addictions, with relationships, and now with everything at the tip of your fingers, those of you that are on the internet a lot, that mouse has cost you more trouble, more grief, uh, more restless nights, more marital problems, more relationship problems, because for whatever reason, we can't stay on Walmart.com. Hallelujah. Three o'clock in the morning, everybody else is in bed. How easy is it to slide your mouse over and do something? else. For you husbands, I'm going to hit this one, uh, and you're going to say, I thought you said you weren't going to talk about sin. Well, this is only sin if it's yours. For me, it's a statement. And so at three o'clock in the morning, you have an opportunity. I believe my God, he says it best in his word, that he'll offer us a way out of every temptation that we face. He says, I'll offer you a way out. And what's amazing to me, at 3.01, everyone's sound in the bed, the dog's even asleep, cat's not paying any attention, and so you run your mouse over to look at something maybe you shouldn't look at, and all of a sudden, an evangelist pops up as a, as a pop screen, something you might want to see. That was your way out. And so it's that simple. I believe God does that. I believe God offers us a way out of every situation and how we choose to handle that's up to us. And so God, the devil who deceived them, was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. And and so when we look at hell, I don't know about you, I don't look at hell for me. For me, it's a great education that that it's confirmation for me in the Word that there is a hell. Confirmation for me and myself is I don't want to go there. And, And so when I look at Revelation 20 and 11, it says, and then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is called the book of life. And so we call it, or refer to it, some of us old-time guys, man, uh, that have a few years under our belt. We were taught, and we see it in Scripture, depending on what translation, that was the Lamb's book of life. And so when you talk about another name written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says that when a name is written in the Lamb's book of life, all of heaven rejoices. What a party that is. And I believe a same kind of party on the other side of things is celebrated every time we deny him. I believe all of hell celebrates. 
I believe it says we got them again. They've done it again. We've got them now. I believe this is it. And then you come to the house of God to get a word like this, and I believe all of hell sits there on pins and needles. Half of hell, devil's running around passing out value. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just because of this message. Praise God. And so we see this message pretty plain. It says, and a book was opened, and another book was opened, which is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And anyone not found, verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so these are three or four times that I've just showed you that of the 167 times that hell is referred to in the Bible. I don't want you to think it's a fairy tale that's sitting in a mother goose story that's sitting in a nursery rhyme. This is something I'm just wanting to make you aware of because I want to tell you that we serve an awesome God. I want to tell you the reason I serve an awesome God is because he saved me from some horrible sin. He turned me from a horrible life. So the Lord had removed his hand off of me and the lifestyle I was living, the things I was doing, and the places I was doing it, and in the, with the people I was doing it with, I would have gone to a devil's hell. But instead, he graced me. He graced me. He began to deal with my heart and tug on my heart, and not one time did I feel condemned. When God began to deal with me, I did feel conviction. I felt a, a, a drawing in my spirit, a void that I could not fill with alcohol, that I could not fill with sex, that I could not fill uh, uh, with drugs. I found a void that I could not fill with a, a party or a different situation. I couldn't fill it with different friends. Or, but what, the only thing I could fill that void with was the presence of the Lord. And so I ran from that calling on my life, that drawing on my life for a long time, and I lived like hell, just to be real honest with you, and I don't share all my stuff. But I didn't live godly for a good while. And, and what I call myself, to make it sound better, when I first got saved, I'd say, you know, I was a wild Indian. I was just a wild Indian. I, I don't know why that sounds better, but it made me feel better, right? It sounds better than, hey, I was going to hell, right? And so as the Lord matured me, I had a realization and a revelation that had I not given my heart to the Lord, then anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire because payback is hell. And so we look at that, and we can get depressed about it. And if anybody in here is feeling anxious and depressed right now about it, just, just perk up. Just perk, grab your neighbor by the arm. Don't bring blood. Just grab your neighbor by the arm. Breathe in. Breathe out, because the best is yet to come. I want to tell you that hell is not the end, but i got to finish my scripture before I do that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 through 10. It says, we are bound to thank God always for you. Now, Paul's sending this, this letter out. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Now, I believe, honestly, and not because we're the pastors here, but I can honestly say just from our experience of being at this church, uh, seeing it grow in eight and a half years from 17 people to two services and what you see in here now, we can honestly, and we believe that we could share this with you and say, you know what, because of your faith, your faith uh, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. We have seen that in this church. We have seen that no matter who comes in, uh, because of the grace of God that, that was uh, given to us, because of the grace that we extend to anyone that darkens those doors, it don't matter what your past looked like or yesterday, you may smell like Friday night or last night. But what I found is that in this ministry, because we base our ministry on the Word of God, that love abounds here. And so if you feel anything but that, have an understanding that's not, the, that's not God whipping you, that's the enemy confusing you. And what we bring today is not a condemnation, but we may bring some conviction. And so with the love of God loving you right now, and maybe possibly loving some ugly out of us, right? Or, or maybe just confirming some things. Confirming some things. I knew I should have took that stand. I knew I was standing right. I knew everything is not okay. And there's confirmation in our spirit. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and for your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And so you've had patience and you've had faith through all your persecutions. It's the one that when tribulation comes, when trial comes, that you're ready to fold up like a $2 suitcase. This should ring to someone. 
that says, hey, every time something happens, I want to run back to my addiction. I want to run back to that relationship. I, I want to run back to that thing, to that comfort zone that held me for so long. When I get unsettled, rather than, uh, rather than calling on God, I'm running back to that addiction. I'm running back to that pornography. I'm running back to that sex. I'm running back. I want to be the guy that God's talking about here, that Paul's talking about here, that you, we boast about you among the churches of God because of your patience and your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations. You see, that's the church we need. That's the church the world needs. Because what we found here is that the church is bigger than these four walls. Okay, if you walk around this building, there's 16 walls. But let's just for argument's sake say four walls. Because all of you haven't walked around the building. And so inside these 16 walls, we can get it right. But outside those 16, we need to try to get it right. And so here we are, it says, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. And so my suffering is what? My suffering is what? My suffering is not as great as the kingdom of God. My persecutions are not as great. Nothing I'm going through is greater than the reward of the kingdom of God. And so why can't I hold on knowing that heaven is at stake? Why, why do I give in knowing that hell is at stake? Why can't I stand firm knowing that there's a promise held for me that I can be found worthy of the kingdom of God for which we also suffer? Since it is the righteous thing for God to repay. It's righteous for God to repay. It's righteous for there to be a payback. So God is going to do that. God is going to repay. One, one translation says God will give restitution for. And so let's look at what he's doing here. It says that it, says it is righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So payback is hell. Right? And so we look at that, and you can look at it in the natural because of all you've gone through, but you hung in there. The promise is is that you hung in there. The guarantee is that you hung in there. The payback is when you quit. I, I, I believe today that when you go to work uh, and you work your eight hours and you get paid on Friday for your eight hours or your 40 hours or your 63 hours, you got restitution for your efforts. And so we'll receive restitution one way or the other. And it says, give, look, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When will this trouble stop? When will the shooting stop? When will the bombing stop? When will... Let me tell you when. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And if we ever forget that, that, that God has a plan in this, God has an end to this, we have an end to this, and because of God's plan, we're getting out of this, then we understand that as sad as these shootings are, we don't fall apart like a $2 suitcase. But instead, we call on the God that is faithful and the Father that loves us, the Jesus that died for us, with an understanding that one day, one day, when Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Listen, here's the next part. But in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. That's one of the 167 times that hell is mentioned. And so here we are, we're talking about hell again. A flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so for education purposes today, because all of you probably uh, are good, right? For education purposes, this is an opportunity for you to be soaking it. I heard a couple people just now, y'all sounded like sponges. Just between the, did y'all hear that? Somebody was getting this because they may not need it today, but their buddy may need it tomorrow. And so when we look at this, it says that uh, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see, in heaven, our reward, or at least uh, I, I believe our reward is going to be the fact that we're in the presence of the Lord. That is going to be our greatest reward in heaven is that we are in the presence of the Lord. Our greatest, listen, listen, listen. I believe that our greatest torment, if we choose hell, is to be absent from the presence of the Lord. 
what is the torment in hell? The greatest one will be to be absent from the presence of the Lord. You'll want to feel that drawing, but it's not there. You'll want to feel that peace. It's not there. You'll want to feel that comforter. It's not there. You you won't even be able to put your foot down and say, I've made up my mind. This isn't going to be as bad as they said it's going to be with all of our rebellion that we've brought from earth. We won't even be able to say that. The Bible says that it's a bottomless pit. You'll take no stand in a bottomless pit. You'll make up your mind here or you won't make up your mind at all and said, and when it comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. What's that mean? That in that day, because you and I believe that it's bigger than the four walls, that you and I believe it's bigger than a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night experience and walk with God, because we believed it. Look what happened. Because we believed it and because we walked it. Look, he's going to be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe because of what? Because of what? Your testimony. Our testimony. Your testimony to your family, to your kids, to your spouse, to your co-workers. Because of your testimony, look, look, because our testimony among you was believed. Because they believed in me. You see, does that give me any glory? Absolutely not. It says he'll receive the glory. But because you took a stand, they believe they can take a stand. We sit, at the, we sit at the tables in the recovery room on Monday nights where we talk about alcohol and we talk about drugs and we talk about pornography addiction and we talk about uh, food addictions and we talk about things up there in that room. And when somebody comes in there and said, I took a stand this week, I'm not who I used to be, their testimony is believed by him and he takes a Her testimony is believed by her and she takes a stand. His testimony, my testimony is believed by you, therefore from this day forward you take a stand. How awesome is that? We get it outside these four walls and so look, maybe you need to hear it straight from the, straight from the mouth of Jesus. I want to give you two portions of scripture. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 41, Jesus said, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, what's crazy to me is that God didn't create hell for you and me. He didn't even... And how do you know? Because on day six, day six, he looked back over his week and he said that everything that he had created, he, and he saw that it was what? If he had created hell, okay, I'm not going to go all the way in there. But listen to me. For those of you that wonder why God prepared, created hell for you, he did not. He sent Jesus for you. In this scripture... You heard it from Jesus in this scripture. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. Listen to me. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Isn't it crazy that uh, uh, Satan was in heaven? Right? A minister of music. A place where there's no sin, a place of perfection, a place of peace. And somehow some ugly rebellion reared its ugly head. And in that rebellion for Satan to try to take God's place and to take over heaven, he was able to talk a third of the angels into following him. Hey, you think it's crazy the life you see. Think how crazy that is. In a place where there was no sin, pride reared its ugly head. Caused rebellion. And they were cast, thrown, thrown, <laughs> out of heaven and hell was created for satan for the devil and his angels and so this morning i just want to challenge you to believe something hell is not for you the bible talks about it being expanded but it's not expanding because he wants to expand it he wanted a bigger hell it's expanding because so many people are rejecting him hell is expanded because we still carry a an act of rebellion a, a place of pride we still think we can do it all. I talked to a gentleman that met with an older gentleman that had become very wealthy in his life. And in the week of his death, he tried to lead him to the Lord. 
And in the week of his death, as he's trying to lead him to the Lord, this gentleman said, I didn't need God. Don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> don't know what to tell you there, man. I'm going to heaven. I don't know what recliner, kind of recliner he's got for me, but. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you fellas don't do that. When I get home and I'm wore out and tired, I mean, if I'm tired, I don't. But if I'm tired, I go sit in the room. We'll talk about that later. And so it says he prepared a place for you, verse number 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And so if you don't get anything else when you leave here today, know that God did not prepare hell for you. It was not prepared for you. But when he saw the rejection of people, the rejection of his son, the rejection of the gospel, hell became enlarged. Hell became enlarged. I want to tell you a quick statement. I've got two scriptures for you, I promise. I want to tell you that in this, in this particular town that we live in, I'm not going to name denominations because I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just going to tell you there's four church denominations that I'm going to read from a survey. I, I don't, it don't matter what the denomination is, but every one of these denominations have a church in Whitfield, with County, probably every county, I know every state in the United States. And so when surveyed, whether they believed in hell or if they chose to deny the existence of hell, uh, here's what it was. The first group, denomination, pop, I'm not going to name any non-popular ones, but I'm not going to name them at all. First group was 35% deny the, existing of, the existence of hell and claim to preach the Bible. The next group, 54% denied the existence of hell or believes there is no hell, but still claim to preach the Bible. 58% of the next one denies the existence of hell or does not believe in hell, but claims to preach the Bible. 60% of the last one I want to talk about denies the existence of hell or believing in hell and still claim they believe the Bible. And so I'm going to challenge you today. You can't believe one part and not believe the other. I have to tell you today that if you believe there is no hell, then you would be believing something contrary to the Word of God. And if you believe that it is not true, but you can pick and choose, then you are mistaken. But if you're going to pick and choose, let me give you some to pick. I want to tell you today that hell is not the end. That story is not the end. When we come in here, listen to me. I didn't come to bring you a message about hell to depress you, to fret you, to scare you, to manipulate you. I came to educate you. Because I believe it is so lacking in this nation, so lacking in the church that we want to tiptoe around, that we don't lose a, lose a tie, that we want to tiptoe around and we don't lose status, that we want to tiptoe around and not offend anybody. Listen, friend, believing in Jesus Christ automatically will offend somebody. So you take that stand early in when you said, Father, forgive me of my sins. You took a stand right there. You made up your mind that moment to choose heaven and not hell. And it's the same way today. And so you've already heard it from Jesus. You've already heard what he said, that there is a hell. You heard from, he from Jesus that there is a heaven. And I can tell you today, I've done a lot of funerals. More funerals than I ever thought I would have done at this stage in, my min in our ministry. But I can promise you this, that every single funeral I've done, every single person that we spoke accolades over, or we refused to speak anything at all because of their lifestyle, and we spoke blessing on the family and hope to the family, every single one of those people, if we could bring them back today and have a testimony service, there would be one, there would be one of two testimonies. They would either come back and they would say, listen to me, because I care about you, because I have compassion for you and your family, because I know what is going on here, there is a heaven, and you don't want to miss it. And because, or the other side, because of my compassion for you and your family and because of my care for the church, I can tell you that there is a hell and you don't want to go there. You see, my friend, there is a hell. But I can promise you this, that's not the end. Praise God, amen, that he sent his son Jesus, 
that there was an angel show up and he said, I come and I speak good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And so from the time the shepherds were watching their flock, amen, from the time the shepherds were watching their flock, we've had hope. From the time the star was hung, we've had hope. And from that time till this time, we've had hope. And so I want to tell you something. God did not create hell for you. He did not prepare hell for you. But he has prepared heaven for you. And he's prepared a way for you to get there. Amen. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's for the believer. I'm challenging you today with the word of God. Listen to me. It says right here. I'm going to give you three verses. It may be two verses. Uh, it says right here that he did prepare heaven for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Today, 2018, I don't care how many thousand years have passed. I don't care how long your granny's been telling you Jesus is coming again. I don't care who preached what or who preached when. I'm telling you today, according to the Word of God, Romans 10 and 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, it don't matter what color you are. It don't matter what you've done in your life. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter your social standing or your financial status. Status. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Murderers can be saved. Rape, we don't understand it. But God loves a murderer like he loves me. He hated his sin like he hated my sin. But he's offered us a way out. He's offered us a way in. Amen. He said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 and 9, it says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, the Bible tells me that Jesus carried my old ugly sin over 600 yards down a cobblestone street. They made my sin look like a big old cross. And as he drug that cross across that cobblestone street, at every moment, at every piercing, at every time that they had been hewing that cross out, that every time the splinters dug further and further into his body that should have already been dead but he saw you in 2018 he said I'm going to rescue him I'm going to save him I'm going to deliver her I'm going to make a way for her and he done that 600 yards he drug my sin to Calvary 600 yards he made up his mind and at any moment the the word tells me that all of heaven stood at attention they were honoring their savior well their Jesus our savior and at any moment, had he have said, come and get me, if they're not worth it. Come and get me. They're not worth dying for. Come and get me. I'm not doing this for them. I believe all the corridors of heaven were lined with angels. I know there will be no tears in heaven. I know there will be no crying and no sorrow for us in heaven. But I have to wonder, while Jesus was hanging on that tree for you and me with my sin on his back, with your sin on his back. I'm wondering if quite possibly the angels weren't having to control their emotions as they saw their Jesus, as they saw that son that stepped out of eternity and into time so that you and I could have eternal life. I'm wondering how they held it together. Because as a pastor, I sit and I watch people that they'll get in and they're drug out. They'll choose to get in and they'll choose to get out. They can't get settled because nobody's helping them get settled. I'm telling you, this is a settling word today. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It don't say what color, does it? Where they're from? No. No creed, no religion. It says whosoever. Whosoever. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Which means, and I'll just paint it as, as pretty as I can, when we were at our nastiest. When we were at our dirtiest, when God chose not to look upon our sin, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he turned his back on Jesus, and Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And he did so for you and me. He done it for you and me. And so hell isn't the story for today. Payback is hell. It is. However you look at that, payback is hell. But our reward is heaven. There's not a fight you want that you'll fight that hell isn't better. There's not a, a war that will be warred against you that heaven is not better. You see, my reward is greater than my sacrifice. 
My reward is greater than my obedience. My reward is greater than my fight. And I've made up my mind. I want you to make up your mind that you choose heaven today. That you put, listen, you don't even have to, I don't, I don't even think about going to hell. Why would I, right? I'm born again. I think about going to heaven. Only reason I'm preaching this is because God said somebody here needed this today. Somebody needs that today. They need to know there is a hell and they'll appreciate the fact that there is a heaven. They'll appreciate what my son did for them. They'll honor that with their walk. They'll honor that with their vocabulary. They'll honor that with their lifestyle. You see, he's called us to be separate. He said, I'm calling you out to be separate from the world. You know, we should look a little different. Well, pastor, you look like a guy down the road. Okay, hopefully a guy down the road saved. Hallelujah. But my walk with God should be different than that guy's if he's not saved, right? And so when we look at this, I want to challenge you again. Three scriptures. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if you confess with your mouth uh, Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And John three sixteen, Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. One more scripture that we don't get on a banner. It's never on a bumper sticker. It's never in a stadium. John three seventeen. For those of you that feel a little bit, whatever, pushed by the enemy today, John 3, 17 says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So any condemnation, anything you feel today, any heaviness that you feel like the, everybody's against you, listen to me, that's not God. God wants to love on you this morning. God wants to love on you. You know, I can remember God loving the ugly out of me. I mean, not physically. Y'all hold on. <laughs> <laughs> no false teaching in here. I'm just saying. He loved the ugly out of me spiritually. He loved the ugly out of me spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And I praise God for that. And I want you to see that this morning. If you'll stand to your feet, if you'll give me about two more minutes. God is so good to us, isn't he? He's an awesome God. If you'll bow your heads with me. The reason I'm asking you to bow your heads, listen, this is just a moment for you to take some time with God. Just take a moment. Just bow your head and think for a moment because I'm going to talk to you just a second. Maybe today you came in and you're as right as rain, you know? Maybe today you come in with a load and you just needed to drop that. You just needed to get rid of that here today. Can I tell you something? When Jesus died on the cross, he said that when you accept him as your Savior, he cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. That means anything from this moment back, gone. Start fresh, brand new kind of like get a new plate at the buffet right so you got you a new plate and so now let God fill it up let God fill it up but what he also took he didn't just take your sin he said that I want to take your guilt I want to take your shame I want to take your regret no longer do you have to petition me with those so now from this moment forward if you'll listen if you'll pray with me in a minute from this moment forward you no longer petition him with that sin that regret that shame that guilt but you petition him with your dreams you petition him with your hopes you petition him with your aspirations you petition him with your calling your purpose your mission you petition him to lead you and guide you amen and so today while you've been thinking i just want to pray over you heavenly father we thank you lord for every person that darkened these doors lord if it's somebody today that just has been battling god you give them strength I speak courage over them today that they're going to be able to stand like they thought they could never stand. And God, today, maybe they've come in with an illness or a sickness. God, I just speak today healing in this house. That God, maybe, maybe it's possible that they're going through a storm. And Lord, maybe you've chosen not to calm the storm. But Lord, today, we ask you to calm your child. That the storm may still rage, but they find peace and they find calm in you. And Lord, if there be one or many that hasn't asked you into their heart, that hasn't made a profession of faith and said, Father, forgive me. God, touch their hearts right now. Show them that you did not, you did not create or prepare hell for them, but you did prepare heaven for them. And so, God, we give you glory and we give you praise this morning. Now, with your head still bowed, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, this altar is always open, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. But can I do this? Maybe you would be bold enough to say, Pastor, I'm not saved today. I can honestly tell you that should the Lord come back, 
or should my life be required of me? I don't know where I would spend eternity. If that's you and you want to pray with me, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand, okay? But if that's you, listen to me. You're okay to pray this in your mind, all right? Your neighbor don't have to hear you, but if your neighbor hears you, I hope they'll encourage you with a hand on your back or a prayer beside of you. But if you would pray this with me today, saying, I'm not sure, that's the same as a no for me. I'm not sure, but I want my heart to be right with God. I'm ready. Today's my day, and if that's you, just repeat after me, and I'm going to go slow. Heavenly Father, I know I've messed up. I know I have sinned. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my shortcomings, my mistakes, and my errors in judgment. Come into my life and make me new. Now declare this with me. This day, I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Now do this for me. If you're praying, listen, you've settled it all. Now thank Him for it. Thank you for saving me, for making me clean. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Give God a hand clap of praise, would you? You don't have to leave. What you need to know today is not so much, not so much that you need anybody's approval, but can I tell you something? If you came in here saved, awesome. We love you and we're proud of you. If you came in here this morning and turned everything over to God, can I tell you something? We are so proud of you. We are so excited for you. This church is proud of you. This church is excited for you. And I want to challenge you today. The Bible says that he who believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, you already believed in your heart to salvation, didn't you? Those of you that prayed or those of you that have done this before today, you believed in your heart unto salvation. But can I ask you that second part? And you confess with your mouth that he is Lord. So sometime today, maybe you'll tell me, Maybe some of you don't know me and said, hey, that's a safe guy. I can tell him. I don't even know him. But maybe you'll tell somebody today, today I chose Christ. Because you believe with your heart, you confess with your mouth, and I promise you this, you're on the right track. Amen. Amen. Give God another hand clap. We need to have prayer real quick. We need to have prayer. If you'll remain standing with us just for a minute. I need a couple of prayer cloths anointed today. Uh, for Miss Rosie, uh, also a three-year-old uh, little boy named Jetty, right? Three-year-old named Jetty. Jedi has cancer, and we want to send a prayer cloth with uh, with Melanie if she wants to come up here, and we're going to give Rosie two prayer cloths as well. Uh, we want to pray over these needs today. I, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what torment people f face in their mind. Uh, it, I don't know that we our, our message on anxiety the other week got recorded or not or got put on our, our web page, but if it did and you're tormented in your mind, uh, dig on there and see if it's on there. And if it's not, I'll get you one, uh, uh, just a uh, audio one. Uh, but we don't know what people go through in their mind. We don't. And it's a, it's a scary time that we're so quick to judge when we should be so quick to be moved with compassion. And so I challenge you to do that. And, and don't worry about that loving God that sends people to hell. Don't let that consume you. Think about how great it is that that perfect God in a perfect heaven is giving us access. Amen. Let's pray for these needs today. These are for two children as well. This is for three-year-old Jedi. And we're just believing that this cancer, listen, listen. The Bible says that Jesus is the name above every name. Guarantee if they've diagnosed this child, they've put a name on that. And we speak Jesus over that today. And I believe when we come together, when we come together in one mind and one accord and agreement, the Bible says that if two of us would agree on touching any one thing, that he'll do it. He'll be it. Amen. Let's pray today for this. God, we just thank you for this little three-year-old. 
God, not for the trial or not for the sickness, not for the disease, but God, for the opportunity to call on the King of glory, the healer, to call on the one that formed him in his mother's womb, the one that knew him before he was conceived. And so, God, I just speak over this baby, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, that this cancer has to dry up, that we believe that you went to the whipping post, took stripes for our healing for every manner of sickness and disease, and we speak Jesus over this little baby. But, God, there's a family involved here. God, we pray for this mom and dad. We pray for these grandparents. We pray for the extended family that's loving on this little baby and their hearts are filled with concern and even worry and anxiety and despair is knocking on their door. God, we speak the power and the love of Jesus Christ today over that family in Jesus' name. God, over these two prayer cloths here for these children. God, I just pray that you would minister right now. This prayer cloth holds no power, but God, we send it with power and authority from the throne of grace and mercy, Lord, that your love would abound, that your spirit would abound, that Satan has no authority and no place in this situation. God, we give you praise. We give you praise for this mom that cries out to heaven, Lord, every night, that cries out in the name of Jesus and behalf of her children. Bring peace to her, calm to her tonight as you minister, Heavenly Father, to these in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, would you? We love you today. Two things. We're getting ready for our ushers. They can start on this way. Megan and Brian Scott's house burnt down this week. If you don't know them, it's our bass player, Dennis, his wife, Lisa. It's their daughter and son-in-law. They lost everything they had, everything. And in that... It's time for God's people to step up. And so today, we know they'll have insurance settlements coming, and they'll have, and they'll have probably. But I don't know if you've gone through that. Pastor Tammy went through a fire when she was about 18 years old. They lost everything they had, and it is, they lost everything they had. And so today, we just want to hold up Megan, and I'm going to pray over this offering. If you could give, that would be awesome. But before I do, if you're getting baptized today, if you could just meet me up here. We have about 14 or 15 on the list. Only one so far said they can't make it. I just need to know what's happening. If you need an address, I'll give you that in just a second. As soon as I, while they're taking up offering, I'll give you some information. But let's pray over this offering today. I believe no matter what it is, God is going to multiply it and make it abundant. I, I believe the special toys that their three kids had. Listen, that's huge. I don't know if it's huge to everybody. That's just huge to that kid. They've lost everything but the clothes on their back. Praise God, though. Listen, praise God. Praise God. They were out to eat. Got to call their houses on fire. So I challenge you today, this morning, if you can, if it's 10 cent, please drop 10 cent in. We don't have a limit, and I know they don't. But let's bless them today. Let them see the, that their church family is, wants to love on them, amen, financially today. And there may be some things, other things we can do later uh, as they get settled. But let's just believe for this offering to be blessed, amen. God, we just thank you today for the gift and the giver today. God, I know we've already extended, some of us have extended ourselves giving in our normal tithes and offerings, but Lord, those that are able today to give and those that are not able, God, as we offer prayer today, God, we just pour our, out our heart to you that one of our family, one of our family members, some of our family members have suffered great loss. And God, we just praise you today for provision and protection that all of them can still hold hands, hug necks, have family Bible study or go out to eat. We praise you for that. But God, we praise you for provision as well, that you're able to bless them today financially. And as we bless them financially, God, we know you're going to bless us financially. We give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' name. As they wait on you, uh, as all ushers wait on you, we appreciate your giving. Let us not take that for granted today. But if you want to go to the baptizing, it's exit 80. I-81 to exit 80, Fort Chiswell. Take a right. You'll go out to Austinville Road. There's a riverboat store. It's a store painted like a riverboat. Take a right. The church is about two miles on the left. Austinville, Assembly of God. It's really easy to find, but if you need us or need some directions more than that, please give me a shout before you leave. And all of our baptizees up here, if you would, just for a minute. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you at the baptizing. Have a great day.